After years of investigation by government agencies, the feds made their move and arrest suspended USF professor Sandy Alarian. In his capacity as a leader in the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, he directed the audit of all monies and property of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad throughout the world.
common level, it's easy to understand. There are certain organizations around the world that engage in violence, and the government is saying, don't supply material support for these organizations, such as guns, for example, or money. But these material support laws go much further than that. And the government uses them as a trap or a trick to get people that they want to lock up in jail. It criminalizes certain activities such as charity. Uh, and the, the Holy Land Foundation case is a great example of that. You're going to hear from that later on. Uh, Nader will talk to you about that case. But I think it's, it's one of the classic cases of preemptive prosecution in which charitable work compassion for people in need and trouble is turned into an act of, of, of criminalization, an act of uh, material support for terrorism. Another uh, activity is free speech. Free speech is criminalized under the Material Support for Terrorism Act. And that was, uh, Samuel Larian case is a good example of that, where he was advocating for uh, the rights of Palestinians, and there were other organizations, designated terrorist organizations like Hamas, that were advocating for the rights of Palestinians. And the government was essentially saying his, what he was advocating for sounds too much like what they were advocating for. And so therefore, he's, in, he's engaged in material support for terrorism. Uh, in this country, we used to think we still had the right for free speech. We don't. Uh, a famous case that was uh, from the Supreme Court, the Humanitarian Law Project versus Holder held that a person, you don't have the right to free speech as long as it is coordinated with a designated terrorist organization. Well, what is coordinated? Is it simply saying the same thing that a designated terrorist organization on it? Palestinians have rights? Is it reading literature from some organization? Is it meeting somebody from that organization? We don't know. But the result is that uh, all of our rights to free speech have been chilled. Um, one of the most amazing things that comes out of this is that peacemaking can be material support for terrorism. Up here on the wall, I have some, the people in pink here are, are uh, folks who engage in peacemaking. They go to conflicted areas of the world, like Palestine or in Colombia, where there's violence, and try to bring peace, try to talk to organizations, sometimes designated terrorist organizations, who are engaging in terror. And they try to convince them that there's a better way of doing it, that they don't have to engage in terrorism, that they can get together and make peace. And our government says that that activity is giving advice to terrorist organizations, and that is material support for terrorism. So the FBI comes in, breaks down the door of their house, holds them at gunpoint, uh, ransacks their house, takes their computers out, takes all their literature out, takes it before a grand jury, and is trying to get an indictment of them for engaging in peacemaking. Uh, hospitality is another big area. Uh, and, and perhaps one of the saddest cases I've seen was Ali Chandia, who uh, had a friend over in Afghanistan who came over. Uh, he, he, Chandia had visited this person before, stayed at his house when he was abroad, and the person came back to visit. In the meantime, the organization for which this person worked had been put on the designated terrorist list, but he was nonetheless allowed to come to the United States. And he stayed with Ali Chania. And he asked to borrow his cell phone to make a phone call. And Chania gave him his phone call, and, and uh, he made a phone call. And he asked if he could borrow his computer to order some paintballs. And he allowed him to order his paintballs. Those two acts, allowing a person to use his cell phone and allowing the fund that somebody to borrow your computer, that was material support for terrorism, and he's now spending some 22 years in jail. So these are some of the activities that the government uses and misuses to take people who are engaged in good activities, in beneficial activities, in peaceful activities, and turn it into something ugly and mean and illegal, and to lock people up for it. Another way that the government tries to get people is to use uh, agent provocateurs. They uh, hire people to go and uh, go to mosques, uh, survey mosques, and to try to talk people into uh, committing acts that, do, that would be material support for terrorism. I think one of the saddest cases was the Tariq Shah case, 
Tariq Shaw was a famous bass player, jazz player. If you go on Google, you will see him. He actually played the Clinton's inaugural. And for some reason, the FBI wanted to go after him. We, we don't quite know why. But they hired a uh, agent provocateur to pretend to be his best friend. And the guy worked on it for several years, and finally became so frustrated with what the FBI was trying to do that he went down and he set himself on fire in front of the White House. The guys ran out and put out the fire. He, he didn't die. But here was a, an F, a, a somebody who the FBI was trying to use and who just felt that this was completely inappropriate and set himself on fire. Then the FBI really wanted to get him, so they hired another guy to go out and get Tariq Shaw. And this guy first took bass lessons from him, learned about jazz. Then he said he lost his apartment and could he move in with him. And so he actually moved into the house and lived with him for several months, pretending to be his friend, best friend, meanwhile following him around with a tape recorder, tape recording things while he tried to talk him into using radical language, which he could spin somehow into a case of material support for terrorism. And he finally got him to say, would, would you uh, uh, help anybody who wanted, would you help anybody who wanted to um, uh, learn how martial arts, he was a martial arts teacher, would you, for example, train Al-Qaeda agents? And he said, yeah, sure, I'll train anybody, I don't care who they are. And that was enough to get him. So he's now spending 22 years in jail. So these are some of the, the things that the government is doing uh, in, to, to lock people up. The National uh, NCPCF, the National Committee to Protect Civil Freedoms, uh, is engaged in three campaigns. One campaign is against profiling, and profiling, as you know, is this practice by the government. We're all supposed to be equal under the law, but when the government picks out things like gender or sex or ethnicity or national origin or language uh, and treats people in these categories differently, that's profiling. And that's very damaging to our country. Preemptive prosecution is an extreme form of profiling in which you target a particular group and you go after them and start trying to take people down and lock them up as a way of scaring people, frankly, into giving up their rights as American citizens. And finally, we are, have a campaign against uh, abuse of prisoners in jail, and particularly in solitary confinement. Uh, as Solitary confinement is a very painful, very painful kind of form of torture. Under the uh, Geneva Conventions, uh, prisoners should not be locked up for more than 15 days because to be locked up for more than 15 days is considered torture. But here we routinely put prisoners in, in prisons for days, weeks, uh, decades. We recently had a, uh, a prisoner Herman Wallace had been in solitary confinement for four decades, for 40 years. And finally, the judge looked at this case and said, this, is, this was a wrongful conviction. I'm throwing it out. After 40 years in solitary confinement, they threw the conviction out, and they sent Herman Wallace home, and he died three days later. And his fellow prisoner in Angola is still in, in solitary confinement. They still haven't let him out. So. These are conditions that we have to confront and we have to do something about. Um, the NCPCF uh, tries to advocate for all of these people. They are our clients. We are an organization that was formed by political prisoners. And we try to do what they need. One of the things that uh, often happens is that families of these prisoners are dealing with great trauma. They are suddenly principal person in their family is snatched away, the community that should be supporting them is often traumatized, and they have no place to turn. And so one of the things we're trying to do is to get the families together. Uh, we have a family conference every six months to uh, get the families together and talk about their own particular issues and the kind of skills that they need to navigate this strange new world in which they are thrust. Um, we also deal with a lot of issues from the prisoners. Uh, because they are particularly stigmatized in jail and put in solitary confinement and treated as terrorists so that even within the jails they are treated as the lowest class uh, and the guards very often will retaliate against them. And so we have found that 
the Justice Department is actually rather self-conscious about this. And so we write a lot of letters to prisons saying, you are being watched. We are watching you. We know what you're doing. And we find that very often they will back off if they feel that there's an organization out there that is taking note of what they're doing. So we try to get lawyers. We try to make sure that everybody has access to lawyers. Um, one of the big problems that often comes up is that uh, ICE or one of the other federal agencies will swoop in and seize a family that is not properly documented and try to deport them. We need to get lawyers immediately. One of the member organizations of our coalition is the National Lawyers Guild, and they've been terrific in some helping us uh, get lawyers that can run to a spot within a couple of days and file papers and get deportations blocked or get people out on bail and this sort of thing. Um, Mel, of course, is the head of our education committee, and she goes around the country setting up events like this because we have found that most Americans are woefully ignorant about what the government is doing and the kind of rights that we are losing as American citizens. We have some really terrific legislation, frankly, that would, we think, get a lot of these prisoners out of jail um, because we think that these cases were fake to begin with, that they were phony, and if they were ever reviewed properly, we could get them all reversed. But unfortunately, Congress at this point is so dysfunctional that we have not been, been able to make any traction in that respect, and we're going to keep trying. So these are uh, some of the things that we're trying to do for the National Coalition to, to turn things around a little bit. And I think I've probably talked more than my 15 minutes. Right. So I'm going to, at this point, I'll turn it back over to you, right? together in the hospital. I spent the night three nights, three days in a row, and it was a fairly nice weekend, but I just wish I knew what was going to, that it was going to be our last weekend together. Her friends came every morning and every night. They brought snacks, games, and movies. My family even came from other states to see her. Everyone she asked for was there, except for one very important person my father. Throughout the whole weekend, day by day, my sister's body was slowly shutting down. The doctors decided to send her to the ICU on Sunday morning. I had no idea what was going to happen. I thought she was being taken to the ICU like 
her last few hospitalizations. I had gotten used to the whole thing where the doctors worry about her. They send her up to the seventh floor. She gets better and we all go home. But this time, it was different. Who would have known that it would be the last time she has to go up to the ICU? Every day, Sinabin would ask for my father more and more. She believed that my father packed his bags and was on his way. Sinabin turned 26 years old in March and knows it's, pos it's impossible for my dad to be there. But because she was getting even more ill, her body was shutting down day by day and it went back in time as if she was a six-year-old. She spoke like a child, made silly jokes, and giggled, giggled when she said a cute secret out loud. It was also innocent. Where is my father, you ask? He is locked up in a maximum security federal prison in Terre Haute, Indiana, almost a thousand miles away. You see, my father was founder and CEO of the Holy Land Foundation, which was shut down by the Bush administration under the orders of, of Ariel Sharon, December 2001. The HLF was a charity organization that helped the needy all over the world. A charity that helped, that gave homes to orphans. A charity that brought unfortunate sick children to the, to the best hospitals in the USA to get treatments they needed. It was an organization that saved thousands of lives. When my sister was born March 25th, 1987, she was born with cystic fibrosis and the doctor said that she would not be able to live past the age of seven. But guess what? She proved everyone wrong, and she lived 26 long, beautiful years. Her existence inspired my father to open the HLF. My father would stay day and night right by his baby's side at the hospital. He thanked God for giving us the blessing of living in the United States of America. He thanked God that his little baby was under the care of the best caring doctors in the world. But my father never only thought about him, himself. He thought about the poor orphans all over the world. How come they are living in com how, how come we are living in comfort while they are hardly living? If it wasn't for my sister Sanabin, the Holy Land Foundation would have probably never existed. And many children would have never even been able to make it due to their poor nutrition, no shelter, and no one to love them. All my sister wanted was to see her dad. All she wanted was to feel his hand on her hand, comforting her during this hard time. And I still remember when my dad called on Saturday, a day before she went to the ICU. Sanabi started tearing up and she said, Baba, when are you coming? I want to see you. I need to see you before I go. And my dad asked, go where? And she said, Jenna, which means heaven. We all giggled, holding back our tears. We thought it was cute. We had no idea that it was her last days. She then tells my dad, it's okay, Baba, I will be okay. I know it's a better place for me. My dad then started comforting her. He knew what's up. He knows everything going on, even if we don't tell him. Like, he just has that, that special, I don't know, that magic in him. He told her about all the great things in heaven. He, he told her that she will finally have no more pain and she will be the happiest she can ever be. She asks for him again and he tells her that no glass windows, no iron prison walls, and no concrete fences can come between them and he is always with her. And this all happened over the phone. He had to comfort her over the phone and when he could be sitting, with his baby girl, holding her in his arms. A father not allowed to see his daughter is the worst pain anyone can ever have, and it hurts to the max, especially when you are locked up in a high max prison, not being able to do anything but pray and cry. A little girl with cancer gets surprised by her, by her father, who was in the military protecting our country. That's wonderful. My sister, who has diabetes, cystic fibrosis, and thalassemia couldn't have her father who protected thousands of children in every country come comfort her. Why? Because he's locked up in a place where he does not belong. Aren't we all equal? Aren't we just as American? I was born and raised in America, 
And just because I am of Arab descent does not make me any less of an American than anyone else. And just because my religion is Islam, it does not make me less of a human being than any other human being. Arab American, Asian American, African, Latin American, we are all one. We are all Americans and should live together in peace, no matter what race or what religion. I am an Amer Arab American and I am proud of it. This is exactly what my father taught me growing up. He always told me to be proud of being an American, and he showed love, and he never showed hate. I used to comment about the prosecutors all the time, and he would always tell me to never say anything against anyone, because in the end, everyone has a family, everyone goes home, they all show love to each other, and wishing bad upon anyone else only makes you as bad. Would a terrorist tell a daughter that? Would a terrorist help their daughter with school and motivate her to finish college. The weekend I spent with my sister, Sanabe, I had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with her. And she told me that I'm doing everything right. The only thing I need to do is finish my education. And that's exactly what I'm doing. I want to make her proud, as well as my father, who, by the way, motivated her to finish her bachelor's degree here at UTD. And she got her bachelor's in child life development despite of her illnesses and hospitalizations. The HLF 5, Abdurrahman Oda, Shukri Abu Bakr, Hassan al Ashri, Muhammad al Muzayn, and Mufir Abu Khadr are all advocates of peace. They are, in, they are in prison holding their heads high, and because they know they did nothing wrong, they are not ashamed. Since what is feeding the needy and providing homes to the homeless a crime, since when is sending poor students to college a crime? Since when is building hospitals overseas a crime? Only in America. The home of the brave, yes, but it's definitely not the land of the free. We have a beautiful country, but unfortunately, we have no real justice system. Tell me about our wonderful <coughs> justice system. People like George Zimmerman, who killed an African-American young boy, Trayvon Martin, can have the freedom to spend with his family. But these five men who kept kids off of the street, who never even held a gun, end up with life in prison. November 27th, by the way, will mark the fifth year anniversary of their imprisonment. And tell me again about how wonderful our justice system is. And I hope that one day, we will truly stick to our pledge, the Pledge of Allegiance. And I hope that one day we will truly be one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nida. We're all praying for you. And I mean, I know we're all very touched. And I hope that the emotions that are being stirred up here tonight are not just emotions, but they're also translated into motivation and action because it takes each one of us to put an end to wrongful imprisonments and other atrocities that are happening by our government by our noses. Um, so up next, I have um, Dr. Mel Anderbach once again. She has another video that she'd like to show you guys, um, and she will be introducing that. before his trial, and he had one six-month period where he never left his cell. And I've also found since then, most, most Muslims go through that same, the pre-trial, they go into solitary confinement. And most of these people on this wall have been in solitary confinement. And so I'm going to just show you another short video, and I, I think you saw we have a petition that, which is being put together by the National Religious Campaign Against Torture, so I hope you sign that before you go. Uh, it's not just Muslims in solitary confinement, there are at least 80,000 people in this country in solitary confinement right now. So, uh, watch this. And then, uh, the hole, the bucket, the cane, the box, 
the whole thing. The chiller. Like a maxi maxi. The shoe. Solitary confinement. The cell is probably like maybe seven feet, maybe nine feet long. Maybe nine by six. It's, it's very small. The cell was a windowless cell. Uh, the walls were cinder block. The floor, it was concrete. The bed is concrete. There's a uh, small concrete slab that serves as the table. You got nothing in the world with you. It's hard to describe nothing. You see a lonely body in a cell that's empty. That's what solitary confinement is. Metal or cement. That was it. The light. There's lights on uh, most of the night. Double neon light. The light would be on sometimes 24-7. It never went out. The situation I was in, they never turned the lights on. The lights were out. 24 hours a day. There was a big door that closed and you didn't hear anything outside of the door. It can get eerily quiet in this place. Real quiet. Most of what you're gonna hear is your own breathing. You might hear your heart rate pumping up. And so when there is a noise, it's just nerve-wracking. Coming onto the tier, it's a heavy steel door and it opens a light. Which means you get <laughs> I really wanted to talk to somebody, you know, if somebody to be there. You can go days without talking to people. Sometimes weeks, sometimes months. You can't touch anyone. No human touch, except for aggressive touching by guards when they were coming to chain me up to take me out. Even if you have family, there's no contact visits at all. There's a glass in front of you with a person visiting you on the other side. My daughters were trying to kiss the glass and kiss me through the glass. It was painful. It's very painful. Spent seven and a half years in the control unit. Maybe about 12 years in lockdown. Oh, that's 29 years, you know. Many, many years in solitary confinement. Solitary confinement is just as real as real could be. It could, um, it could wipe the mind. It damages you psychologically. You know, because uh, human beings need to interact with each other. It's not normal to be in the dark for days and days and days on end. I could hardly sleep without the night inside. Waking up at night in the sweats, panic attacks. They would trigger something in my marriage when I would break out in the house and have to tell. I lost track of time. There's no concept of time. You know the time in lockdown. There's sleep and awake. That's it. And the madness in between the I would try to hear things, try to hear human voices. And um, sometimes I would imagine that I was hearing voices. You start hearing things that's not even being said. And say, yeah. You know, yeah, what? And nobody's answering. Anger, the rage, the bitterness, the anxiety, the nightmares. And, and as years passed, it just seemed like the walls in the cell began to close in. They begin to close in. You can feel your mind like trying to escape from it. And what happens is chaos. Insane.
they say the end of the barrel. That's what the prison officials call it. Call it maximum security, administrative segregation. Isolation. Special housing. You know, on and on and on and on and on. I would say torture chambers. No other way to describe it. Of course it's torture. It, it, it's, it's torture in every form of fashion. Traffic violation. 
And then they will want to go through and look through your car, or look through your house, or look through your bags, or get a hold of your computer and download everything in your computer. And one of the things that you have to say right up front in the beginning is, I don't consent to a search. You have to make that very clear. I don't consent to a search. Uh, because uh, they will take any ambiguity in what you say as a consent to a search. Um, and then the final thing is, uh, if you are being bugged by a, a police officer, an FBI agent, who has stopped you and would like to frisk you, find out uh, you know, if you're carrying any concealed weapons, and then wants to know what's in your bag, and are you carrying something that's contraband, and so on and so forth, you can finally just confront them and say, am I under arrest or am I free to go? And that puts the, the uh, police officers in the situation of having to decide whether or not they have enough evidence to arrest you, and typically they don't. And so very often they will back off and uh, say, okay, you're free to go, and then you can leave. Uh, so those are just three phrases that I'd like you to remember. If you take nothing away from what else we hear today, those are three phrases that it's good to remember. A lot of times people uh, are, are a little bit hesitant to go with the first one, I'll have my lawyer call you because they say, boy, babe, a lawyer's gonna cost a lot of money, right? So now do I have to go get a lawyer? Wouldn't it be just easy? Maybe I could save myself a lot of money by just talking my way out of it. And I want to discourage you from that and suggest that there are organizations, and particularly the National Lawyers Guild, that will give free legal services to you on this. And it sounds complicated, it's actually pretty simple. I've done this a lot on, on, on many occasions. I've had people up in Albany who the FBI wanted to talk to and came to me. And so I called the FBI agent, I had the card with me, and I called the FBI agent and I said, I'm, I'm ready to come if you want to talk, but I want I want immunity for my client. Uh, and they said, oh, all right, uh, we'll call you back. And I never had a single agent ever call me back. Never. Why? Because they don't want the information. They want to get you into a situation where they can control you and get you to act as an informant. And they know with a lawyer that won't happen. So I would say in 80, 90% of these cases, all it takes is one phone call from a lawyer, and they will leave you alone. Um, so, do not be hesitant about it. Uh, there are some books over here, Know Your Rights. Uh, one is in English, one is in Arabic, and it has numbers there from the uh, National Lawyers Guild where you can call if you want uh, a free lawyer, and I, it's, it's really worth the time. One thing you have to remember, and this is very important, uh, they can lie to you, but you cannot lie to them. And what they really often want is simply to catch you in a lie. If they can get you in a lie, they have you have control over you. They can say, oh boy, you just told us a lie. We can bring charges against you. However, if you wanted to cooperate with us and go down to the mosque and start to inform on people down there, uh, that would be, uh, we won't have to bring the charges right away. And so that's another reason, you see, you do not want to talk with them. The FBI does, typically does not try to fare. So anyway, with that background, careful background, does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask about what your rights are, situations? What, so you say, to say they don't consent to a search, what premise do they have to worry if that won't work at all? Like, I'm sure, but in what situations would you not consenting to a search not matter, only if they have a warrant? Well, that's right. If they have a, a search warrant, that's a whole different thing. Uh, and they may very well come to your house and they have a search warrant. And if that's the case, then saying I don't consent to a search is not going to work because the, the court's already ordered it. What you can do is this. You can say, I want to see the search warrant and see what it is that they are allowed to look for. And what they may have is a rather narrow search warrant in which there's only certain things that they can look for. But of course, they're going to want to look much wider. And the first thing they're going to look for are computers. They want to see the computers. If that's not mentioned in the search warrant, for example, I say, sorry, it's not in the search warrant, you don't get to see the computers, or, or something else that they may want. Uh, another thing that's very important uh, if they're doing a search, uh, pursuit of the search warrant, is to get the name of the officer involved. Uh, and, and typically, there's a lot of officers, and there's, you know, they kind of crash in, and they search the house, and it's just a really big deal. And 
you are in such an emotional turmoil that it's really hard to remember to do that, but try to be really calm about it and systematically go around and try to figure out who, what officers are there. And then find the person who's in charge and say, I want a list. Before you go, you're going to give me a list of everything that you've taken. Because at some point, you're going to have to go down and talk to a lawyer about it. And the lawyer's going to say, well, who were they and what did they take? And if you're not prepared to, to deal with that, then um, at least you want to be able to say, I tried to get that information and they would not give it to me, but this is the one name I could get. And then at least there's somebody you can follow up with. Yeah. How about if they have probable cause? Probable cause to come in and what? No, no, like car, a traffic stop. They want to search your car or backpack or something. Well, that's, that's the question. What how probable cause do they have? If they say they have probable cause, uh, can you say, I don't consent and they'll leave you alone, or do they have the right to search? Yes. If they say we have probable cause that we can do it, don't try to resist that because they are armed and you are not. Okay? So it, it doesn't, it, it's, it's not a good uh, attempt and uh, resistance. But what you want to do is to set up a situation where later in court you can say, I told them repeatedly I did not consent to a search. And I'll tell them, I want you to put that in your notes. I don't consent to a search. But go ahead. If you, if you say you've got probable cause, here's my backpack. Go ahead and search it. But at least you can then say in court, I did not consent to a search. What is your probable cause? Tell it to the judge. And they may not have any probable cause, in which case the whole search will be suppressed. See, that, that would be the theory of it. Because very often what they will say is, I want to see what's in your backpack. Is that okay? Can I do that? And I, I, I have probable cause. And you'll say, oh, okay. You know, here it is. If you, you know, and then they'll say, he consented. <laughs> I don't actually have any probable cause. I can lie with him. He can't lie, but I can lie. But he gave me his backpack voluntarily, therefore he consented. Um, I do have a question on the um, legality, I guess, of customs and airports. Uh, I'm so glad you asked. Because I went through a situation just recently, coming back from Chile with my aunt. And you said you were dealing with the um, case in Syracuse where they got the um, restraining order against them, uh, against the the drone, the drone uh, protests. Oh yes. In yes. And my great aunt got um, taken in her questioning because she's um, got that restraining order against the uh, colonel on right. the base. Yes. So uh, just wondering where that stands, I guess, on situations right. like that. Well, all right, there's kind of two questions, but I, I'm glad you raised the border because the border is a different sort of situation. Normally, what you can say is, am I under arrest? If I'm not under arrest, I'm free to go and just walk away. When you're crossing a border into the United States, or even out of the United States, you don't have that option because you don't have anywhere to walk to. You can't walk across the border. So they basically have you there in the airport. And the, the problem that, that, is, that comes up is they say, we need to know this. We, and they'll start off with very nice questions, you know, like, uh, did you pack your bags? And did you bring any meat products in from, you know, and think, normal conversation that, and they ask a lot of people and, and the, the routine. And then it slowly starts to morph into something else. Um, where do you go to the mosque? What is the name of your imam? Are you a Salafi? Now, at this point, you start to feel a little bit uncomfortable, right? You're like, wait a minute. You know, why, am I, why is that relevant? And at some point, you have to say, look, I'm sorry. You know, I want to be cooperative and helpful, but I don't think you have the right to ask about my religious or political beliefs. Um, and they may say, well, fine, then just sit here until you rot. You can sit in the airport as long as you want, but we're not going to let you cross the border. And it, it, it gets to be a kind of a game of bluffing back and forth. But I would suggest to you that most of the people do not have a basis to hold you. And if it gets to be really uncomfortable, they probably are, are working on something you may not want to be talking about because they may try to catch you in a lie or they may try to get you to say something that is contrary to what somebody else is saying about you. And this is going to be awkward. So you probably just should sit down and say, I want to call a lawyer then. 
and see what happens. Typically, if you ask to call a lawyer, there'll be a lot of grumbling and, you know, this is going to take time. And eventually, they will let you go because they don't want you sitting there overnight in the airport. You may miss your connecting flight. You may end up not getting home when you wanted to get home. You may be very inconvenienced, but it is better than saying something that they will literally claim was false and a lie and a basis for deportation, in, in my view. So, now, you were raising another issue, which is really interesting. Uh, what they have been doing recently, um, where there are protests, people who go down and protest, let's say, at a drone base. There's a little upstate New York. It's full of people protesting at drone bases. We're representing a number of them in trials about that. <laughs> And when you get arrested now up there at some of these drone bases, what they do is they issue an order of protection. An order of protection to protect you from harassing the head of the drone base. If you can imagine. Now, this is like you know, a married couple, and you know, you, the, the husband does something that scares the wife, and so she gets an order of protection against them so that he can't go and harass her. Well, they're analogizing that to the protesters and the head of the drone base as being a kind of a couple in a way, and the protesters have order protection against harassing the, the, the general of the, the drone base. And if you violate that, that's something in this demeanor that carries some pretty heavy penalties. And so you were talking about your aunt is up there, and actually we may be representing that group. I think we're probably going to get yeah, that trial. Yeah. yeah. And this has been a big, big issue upstate as to whether how we, how you represent that, and how you show that this analogy between a married couple and a protester in a general at a, at a drone base is completely ridiculous. It's insulting to women. It demeans the whole point of the order of protection, and it's just one more um, wrong turn in a very complicated and unjust legal system. I can't tell you more than that. We'll do our best. Anybody else got that? First of all, I'd like to thank you for uh, coming over here and giving us this uh, talk. I think that most of the times, uh, the people that, um, that speak about civil rights who don't have a lot, who don't have a lot of sh uh, light on what on their work, are usually the most influential people. Later on, unfortunately, the most influential people in history are known after years what they do, and not not during their lives. So um, that's just one comment, but so so, so so oppression against civil rights is we're not we're not the first minority that this happened to, right? This happened right. to African Americans, happened to Jewish Americans, happened to Japanese, Chinese Americans, etc. Looking at American history, I come from a realistic basis. I think I call it just a little more realist, but so far in all of American history. Minorities got their rights back by speaking to power, and I just wanted your opinion on that because obviously the law is is broken, right? And, and yeah. people don't follow the law. And the second point is the point of freedom of speech. The point of the First Amendment, guys, is it's supposed to protect popular, uh, unpopular speech, right? I mean, you don't have someone holding a sign outside saying "I love McDonald's," and you know the, the law was meant to protect protect this guy's speech because it's everyone, most people like McDonald's, right? It's built to protect unpopular speech. So all the minority groups in this country have changed how they're being respected but in, in court by speaking to power rather than having laws amended. Right. What do you think about that? Well, th thank you. That's, you said exactly what I was hoping I'd get a chance to talk about. Uh, you're actually right. On this wall, by the way, I have down here in this corner right here, you probably can't see it, but um, it's a number of Black Panthers from the 1960s who were put in jail under a program, completely legal program, formed by the government called COINTELPRO. It's a counterintelligence program. And the, the government um, did things like you know, tell lies, disrupted meetings, um, uh, brought false charges against Panther leaders and had them locked up, and even had some targeted assassinations against Panther leaders. Uh, Fred Hampton, probably the most famous of them, was killed. Uh, completely illegal program. And it was done under <coughs> the theory that all of the, particularly the Black Panthers, but other groups at that time, were a, a threat to national security. And so, under this threat to national security, 
making a war, we can make a domestic war against people that were threatening the United States, and in doing that, we can violate the Constitution. It was okay to do that. Later, there was hearings in Congress, and, and Congress said this is completely unacceptable. It is, uh, the government has no right to make war against its own citizens unless they violate the law, and these people were not violating the law. They were simply expressing opposition to uh, the kind of repression they were under. And it was all supposed to have stopped. Of course, it didn't stop. And after 9-11, the government took all these restrictions off and started the whole phone tell probe up again aimed at uh, the Muslim community. And it is, it, it, you're, what you're saying is absolutely true. The only way that you can stop this kind of thing is to build political pressure. All of these, all of these people here are political prisoners. They are here not because of anything they did that violated the law. They are here to provide the government with a terrorist threat, with a threat of, of a national security, which allows them to violate the Constitution, just as they did with Comitopro which allows them to take away our civil rights, which allows them to do things, and I'll just enumerate some of them. Uh, John New, right after 9-11, uh, John New was asked to write an opinion that says that torture is okay. Go ahead, torture people. Now, everybody knows that torture is illegal. It's illegal national law, international law, and treaty law. But John New understood, going all the way back to the Korematsu case, that you can do this if you have a war and you have classified information. So what he did was, he wrote an opinion, complete garbage, total nonsense, legal opinion, that said it was okay to, to torture. And then he classified it. And nobody could prove what was in the, the opinion, other than there was an opinion, a legal opinion, that said it was okay to torture. And so hundreds, thousands of people all over the world were tortured on the basis of this. When Obama came into uh, office, he, the, the, uh, the opinion leaked, and people realized that this was a piece of garbage. It was not a good legal opinion. And everybody was horrified and they said, oh, we have to disbar John Yu for writing this opinion. Uh, then cooler heads prevailed, and they said, wait a minute, this is actually a pretty good way to get around the limitations of the Constitution. And so they made John Yu a professor down at, at Stanford, no, at, at Berkeley where he's teaching law now instead of being disbarred. But that was how they got around the limitations. Now they have indefinite detention, and the NDAA, you can hold people indefinitely, forever, without charges. That's legal. You have a drone kill list. The president has the ability to designate people that he's going to blow up with a drone. And when challenged on that, how can he do that? Especially American citizens. How can he execute American citizens without any trial without any jury trial, without any of the protections in the Constitution, he says, hey, we give him due process, we just, it's just non-judicial due process. <laughs> now this is absolute rubbish, it's nonsense, there's no such thing as non-judicial due process. The very heart of due process is inserting a neutral magistrate between the government and the person who's getting the punishment. So these are all things that the government is doing to violate the Constitution. And of course now we have mass surveillance, right? All of your, your, your emails are read, your conversations are listened into. Uh, all this mass surveillance is against the Constitution, but it is classified. And once again, we have the same problem. When it's classified, you can't show what they're doing. Um, so all of these things, in answer to your question, is absolutely, they're violating the law. And unless we, as a group, stand up against it uh, and make it a political decision, they will not change it. One of the big problems that we all have is that there's the African American community and they're fighting their own little battle. You have the immigrants, the Latino community, they've got their own little battle going with ICE. The Muslims have their own little battle going with the FBI. And all of these, these are typical groups that the US has been repressing for years. And what we have to do is put aside our you know, narrow concerns and join forces together and make a large political movement. And that way we, I think, can get more traction on the illegal things that the government is doing right now than we can individually. So that's just a thought. But thank you. It's, it's a great point and it's something we really have to talk about. Um, Adam, could you touch a little bit on uh, like how the you know, all these cases, there's, there's uh, absolutely no case against them. Yeah, like the defense attorneys are not able to, you know, 
You know, she's saying, why is it that if these cases are so bad, we can't get any traction as lawyers to, to get them uh, thrown out? And this is a very difficult, painful question because we should be getting them thrown out and we haven't been able to do it. Um, one of the things that the government has been doing in most in a lot of these cases is um, doing a lot of unfair tactics which change the make the playing field no longer level. Uh, certainly, the Holy Land Foundation was a very dramatic example of that. They brought in, for example, an anonymous expert to testify that the, the money went to organizations that were controlled by Hamas. Uh, in fact, I think his testimony was false. But how do you show that it's false if you don't know who the person is? He could have been anybody off the street. He could have been the prosecutor's brother for all we know. And we still don't know. An anonymous expert is an absolute abomination in American law, and yet it was permitted. Um, in our case, for example, I was the defense attorney in the arrest case. Um, we had, uh, on appeal, I'll just give you the appeal thing because it'll see what the problem was. Um, we filed our brief, the government filed their brief. Then the government filed a secret brief that we weren't allowed to see. Then the fire government filed a top secret brief that even the prosecutor wasn't allowed to see. We went down and argued it in court, and then we were excused, and the prosecutor had a secret argument before the Court of Appeals, or the, before the Second Circuit. And when the decision came out, it was a completely mangled decision that, that uh, didn't uh, cite the, the record correctly and uh, mixed up the, the issues. The point is that the courts, once you mention the term national security, um, the courts are adopting an entirely different attitude toward these cases and allow the government to do things which, in normal law, would never be permitted. Um, is that an excuse why the lawyers are so bad? One of the reasons the lawyers are so bad is that we're trained to work within the system. And the system is broken. The system is frankly broken. We have to acknowledge that. And I've talked to a number of lawyers who've done some of these cases, some of the biggest names in, in defense, and they say the system is broken. And at some point, as lawyers, we have to say we can no longer work within the system because we are complicit in the injustice which results. But what do we do? Do we abandon our clients then? And are they better off without any legal representation at all? At least we can show the fraud that is being perpetrated. But is the fraud much better if you end up with life in, in prison? Maybe we could argue to get it down to 20 years or 10 years. So this is the, this is the problem that the lawyers face, and it's, it's uh, a very difficult problem, and I think the lawyers are acutely aware of it. Yeah. So, what, what, just uh, thank you for your talk. It's uh, uh, very eye-opening. But uh, what do you think the, the, the root problem of all this is? Because it seems like these are symptoms more than that. there's well, something I'm, going on. That's, that's, exactly. Uh, thank you. I, I agree. There's something going on. I, and is Barack Obama having real power, or is he just? You know, is it more of Congress that, that, that holds the power over this? or Because it doesn't seem like Barack Obama has much power or anything. Well, my theory on it is that um, there has been a big technological jump, a breakthrough. We, because of most of the servers in the world, or at least the majority of our, in the United States, we are able to hook into these servers and listen in on what the entire world is saying. Now, Listening in on everybody's conversation is not very good for catching terrorists, whatever terrorists are. Terrorists are a completely useless word, it means nothing. But it's not good for finding people who want to do violence against the United States because you get so much information and that you have to comb through it to get to just the one or two little bits of information that might suggest that somebody is planning to do something. It's, it's absolutely impossible. It generates too many false positives. So this will never be a very workable system to catch people who intend to do violence to the United States. But it's absolutely great if you can target somebody you really want to listen in on, like the president of France, or the president or the prime minister of Germany, or uh, the president of Brazil, all of whom just recently, by the way, complained about the United States listening in on their phone call. And if you can listen in on the entire world and everybody who is influential, and by the way, dissidents, great to listen in on dissidents or what they're planning to do and, and, and my, minority groups, what their theory is. Um, that gives the government an enormous amount of power. And so I think 
they really want to hold on to this ability to do that, to combine that with power to torture, you know, indefinite detention, drone killing, and so on. That gives you a very good beginnings of a police state. But they can only do it if they're in a war. That's legally, the whole idea is the national security, and you have to have a war. And these folks here, to my way, that represent the war. This is the only way they can sell it credibly to the courts of the American people, is that we have a war. These are the soldiers in that war. The war on terror, whatever the war on terror may be. They may be fake soldiers, the whole thing is a fraud, it's a setup, but it allows them to go ahead with this project and listing it on the whole world, which violates the Constitution. I think that's what they're up to, but that's, I, I may be naive. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Mel, did you mention uh, what, when they get 500 signatures on uh, the petition, what happens? Yes, uh, if they get 500 signatures in a state, this religious campaign against torture or take it to the state legislature and try to make the laws change. So I think in Texas, that'd be really good. There's a lot of people in solitary confinement in Texas. So, so if they haven't signed it, they would be sure to put your state on. We're, we're so happy to be in Texas. There's so many things going on down in Texas. We have Carswell down here, as far as Afia and, uh, and uh, Lynn Stewart are down here, and uh, a lot of death penalty cases. There's not, oh, this is a wonderful state to be in. <laughs> this is where all the action is. Um, other questions? Ask another question. Oh, yeah. um, how do our freedoms stop when we're in other countries? Um, I was crossing into the occupied territories over the summer, yeah. and I was detained for maybe eight hours just sitting there for nothing. And I wanted to know do you have any advice on how to deal with that? Like, are we going to call the ambassador? How does that work? Or do we not have any authority in Israel at all? So. Um, my impression was that if you were not detained, something is wrong. <laughs> uh, this is so standard procedure, and everybody acts so arbitrarily over there that uh, if you you should be very very worried and suspicious if they let you through. Uh, but I, I I'm just joking to some extent. I, no, I don't have any particular uh, advice about it. Um, and, and part of it is because these detention things, the, the arbitrary behavior of the government, changes constantly, even from day to day. And we get this a lot in prisons, for example, where uh, people, the prisoners complain that they're not allowed to pray together. And then there's a lawsuit. And then the lawsuit comes out and says, oh, they have to pray together. And then the, the rules change. And then all of a sudden there's another complaint because it's not done in a certain way. And there's just, there's a constant battle about changing things. Like when the government acts arbitrarily, they will act arbitrarily for a certain period of time and then they change it again. And so any advice that I give about it probably is all out of date within a month or so. I mean, <coughs> this is the way governments harass people. They don't have standard procedures. They don't have ways that will help you through. Every time you get to the border, every time you try to cross something, every time you go through an official site, you have to reinvent the procedures all over again. Um, I was astonished when my, my client, uh, Yassin Arif, um, we moved to a low security prison. We were, we were flabbergasted. Partly because we think now that they, they got the wrong guy. They actually believed he was somebody else. And the whole case was a mistaken identity. And so when they realized it was a mistaken identity, they said, oh, we're not interested. We're moving to low security. So I figured, OK, low security. We brought his family to visit him. This will be pretty easy. And we get in there. And all of a sudden, they have one of these magnetometers that cranks up very high, and the women trying to go through that had wire straps in their bras all got, got caught. Now, they knew this. They knew that it was just a question of a wire thing in a bra. But would they let anybody through? No. Everybody had to take their bra off, and then, you know, the lawyers actually had to, or women had to take, give them bras that didn't have wire straps in them. Now, is this necessary? No. It's complete humiliation, stupidity, and, and kind of arrogance, I think, on the part of the guards to humiliate women coming in to visit their loved ones like this. But it's one of these arbitrary procedures that was put in, and then they took it away a month later, and it never happened again. 
I cannot explain it, you know. But that's what the nature of arbitrariness is. And uh, anyway, that's that's my answer. Yeah. I don't need to decredit your work, but how many success successful trials have there been in these type of cases? And I guess the second part of my question is, what progress do you see in the near future? Well, there've been almost none. And I have to say, not only have there been almost none of no successful cases, but even the few cases that were successful, the government has simply adopted a procedure saying, fine, you lost the first round, we'll bring more charges and we'll do it again. And they kept after it. I think one of the more famous cases was um, Sabi bin Kala, uh, who was part of the paintball case. And he actually was acquitted by a jury because he was in Europe at the time it all happened and wasn't even in involved in it. And so Gordon Cromberg, the Islamophobic uh, DA, uh, um, U.S. attorney in Virginia, called Sabri Bankala before a grand jury and asked him about all the things for which he'd been acquitted and then charged with perjury and got a conviction for perjury and he's now spending 10 years in jail. Whoa. Now, this, this is kind of over the top stuff, but it's happened at least to it. And this is why uh, Sammy uh, Alaria is still in jail. Because he was faced with the same thing. But uh, not in jail, sorry, <laughs> no, under house arrest. You know, can I add to that? I should think it's yeah, by all means, sir. Let me just uh, come in. Uh, there is occasional successes, and one was in Tampa uh, yeah. after Sammy's case. There was a uh, student, two students who were on vacation, had fireworks in their trunk. And so, of course, you know, they're Arab, and so, of course, they're going to put in jail and talk about terrorism. And you know, Sammy's case is a, a big support group, and I'm advocating. Oh, yeah, I'm telling you this because I think it's really important to speak, you know, speak the truth to power. And said that it was really good. But he, Sammy had a big support group. His trial went on a long time, so that allowed the media to find out a lot of things. And this student, these two students, the one that went to trial was acquitted, and we were it was really exciting. Then the government, of course, tried to deport him. And so there's more, and this, his support group continued, and the, all the media attention also, I think, really important to get media attention that's accurate. And he was not deported. That was like the first time ever. Uh, so there is hope. And that's why, I, you know, it takes uh, the activists, it takes the people in the community to you know, stand by and, and uh, you know, speak the truth and get it out there. Well, that was a cheerful one. I, I don't see much progress here, but I do think <laughs> she, she's trying to, but, but she's absolutely right on one point, which is that if we give up and we stop advocating for these people, nothing good will happen. It is important to keep advocating because I believe at some point things will change. And I see signs of it now already in the sense that the courts are now entertaining arguments that they would not have entertained even three years ago, two years ago. And a lot of what happened was that Snowden began to leak these documents showing that the government was lying about a lot of things, including, for example, the NSA and the secret surveillance. And because a lot of these people were, had secret surveillance, um, they, there's a lot of material which should have been given to them which wasn't. And now already, I just saw in the paper a couple of days ago, the uh, government is now saying, all right, we are now going to start telling defendants about the fact that they were surveyed by the national intelligence, suggesting that now it is permissible for defense lawyers to ask for that material to show that their client is innocent. We asked for it, and we were not given that. That's already a, a sign that, that things are loosening up, that the kind of unlevel playing field is starting to level itself out again. So I'm, I'm hoping in the years to come that we're going to get a more level playing field. But right now, we're not making it much progress yet. Right? Do you think that the more level playing fields can be attained if we have more uh, uh, media coverage? Well, <laughs> the optimistic one thinks, yes, we need better, more media coverage. I, I am doubtful that the media at this point is ever going to be very uh, progressive until there's a major swing in public opinion. The reason why I ask is because there's a, uh, I don't know, if you heard of the, uh, West Memphis. Have you heard of the West Memphis uh, Five or oh, West Memphis Three? Um, the uh, three, the three kids in, in West Memphis who were okay. I thought my voice was loud. You know, <laughs> the the three the three kids in West Memphis about a few years ago. 
that were, uh, or a long time ago, in the early 90s, 80s, that were put in jail, um, accused of raping three children. And uh, after a while, there were three different documentaries that were made about those, about those three. And each one got more in detail, each one got more in depth, and each one got more coverage. All of a sudden, you see these celebrities coming in on board to support them and speaking out about it. And um, I mean, the, the, the world that we live in now, when you have that type of voice, you, uh, you definitely will be heard. And you know, later on, they actually got, they, they were uh, acquitted, and they were released from jail. Uh, this was 19 years later, though. Because you know, uh, they decided, okay, let's go back and check DNA, and found out that they were in fact not the ones that were the ones that made the, the, the decline. But the idea was that they wouldn't have got that opportunity if there wasn't enough attention on their case. And right. So, yeah. You're talking. About, I mean, I think there's a big difference between long term and actual at the trial. One of the things I notice is that you can have a case which uh, involves Muslims and. The media does not cover these cases well. Uh, they tend to say, well, you know, they probably brought it on themselves somehow, and you get this kind of very negative reporting of it. Whereas if the same thing happened to, say, somebody who's not Muslim, a regular American, people will get all upset about it, and you get a lot more positive media coverage on it, saying this is an injustice. And I think we've got to change that kind of dynamic to portray the whole Muslim community in a much more favorable and positive light. I don't think most Americans think of the Muslim community as being a very moral, a very um, uh, competent and, and loyal community, which of course it is. And I, I for the life of me, don't understand why the media doesn't portray it in a more favorable way. But I think that's one of the things that will help change it around and, and uh, get, get judges to uh, in courts and other things to start looking at it in a more favorable mm -hmm. way. Can I add one? Yeah, go ahead, Mel. You've got to hear from Mel. She says positive things. You know, another thing is we can be our own media. That's one thing NCPCF does is we film all these things. They're on the internet. You have Facebook now. So it's a media that doesn't tell your story. You tell it yourself. You know, and I think it, it definitely, it's definitely making the difference. As we have, we've been doing this for eight years. And there's a big change in the people now. They have they're much more knowledgeable, and it's not from the mainstream media for the most part. It's for like you know, I mean, it's like Democracy Now is a few that's good, and there's also all the people you know like you <laughs> telling the story, like Nita, you know. So, and that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah. Now, is there any country that has somewhere near uh, reasonable justice? <laughs> you know, my, my wife is Dutch, uh, and so I spend a fair amount of time in Europe with, with various people with different countries, and um, they all kind of have their issues. Uh, Europe is like really uptight about immigrants, even more so, I think, in some respects than, than America is. Um, it's, I, I don't think there's perfect justice anywhere. Um, I, I think some countries handle it much better than we do. I've seen, for example, Canada, I think, handled a few cases, so-called terrorist cases there, in a much more fair way, humane way, than we did using the same defendants, same evidence in this country. Uh, I, I was impressed with how Canada handled it. I think sometimes Britain gets it right, sometimes they don't. Um, it changes. I don't know. Can I say something, Steve? Sure, right. And what Mel was talking about with local media is very important, doing your own events, filming it. But you also want to get media to cover you. Now, Al Jazeera is going to give you, would give you positive coverage. They would understand the message. But the local media, not necessarily. So you have to find ways to manipulate the message so that local media will cover you and cover you favorably. I'll give you an example. In Tampa during uh, Cast Lead, uh, when there were so many, we had uh, so many people killed in Gaza, children, you know, uh, there were some horrible pictures. 
there was a protest near the stadium in Tampa, uh, and there were everybody, people, the, the community was very angry. A lot of youth were out waving Palestinian flags and driving cars and honking horns, which let, let them vent a lot of their anger, but it scared a lot of the people there and it made for very bad press. We later organized um, uh, a, another rally, another protest, where we found natural allies in the community, UCC, Unitarians, uh, that joined with us and we had a silent vigil. Where we just, all we had was pictures of children that had been massacred and candles. We had a, a Christian prayer, we had a Buddhist uh, monk uh, say something, uh, we had a mom, and, and uh, we had tremendous positive media from that. Uh, there was a helicopter that filmed it, there was a very good article in the paper. So you have to be smart in what you do uh, and, and how you get your message out. And look for people in your community who will be allies, to, that will join with you, you know, progressive community, different, different groups uh, that, that can work with you. I, I agree absolutely with what Fred said. Um, I think in particular with the Muslim community, <laughs> one of the big problems is that the FBI comes into a community, they make a big arrest, they have all of this tremendous negative publicity, and people tend to back away from it. They don't want to get involved in it. The mosque doesn't want to comment, uh, or, or they say certain things. And it would be so helpful if people, the communities itself, would stand together a little bit and be able to talk about the person as a human being and say, I know that person. This person was a really good person. He helped, he did a lot of work with the kids in the, in the community. He helped feed people. He's a really good person without having to talk about the charges necessarily, put a human face on it and be able to, to stand up and say, you know, you can't make an assumption just because the, the US government puts out a press release about a person. Uh, let's just wait and see what the evidence is. And in that way, I mean, there's a lot of things that, that the Muslim community can do to speak out about these cases and to, to put a more positive spin on things. And I, I agree with you, absolutely. I think that's very important. Um, we were very fortunate when I had my case up in Albany with the Yusin Arif. There was a, a columnist up there uh, who later got fired uh, for it. But anyway, he wrote a series of articles that were very positive and, and basically trashed the government and the government's case. And it completely changed the whole atmosphere of the case. And one of the reasons he did it was that the president of the mosque, my, my guy was the imam at the mosque, the Masjid as Salam. And uh, the president, Shamshad Ahmad, on the day of the takedown, they raided the mosque. They went in there with the dogs and the bomb sniffing things. And they interviewed 100 people in the community about whether they were terrorists or not. They did all the terrorist tactics that the government always does. The president of the mosque, uh, Shamshad, went down there and stood in front of the mosque. And he said, uh, called a press conference. And he said, I am the president of this mosque. If there's anything wrong that happened in this mosque, I am responsible. I am responsible for everything. Bring the charges on me. Give me the charges. Boy, did that turn things around. Suddenly, the press had somebody who was taking responsibility. Everybody wanted to know what Chumshad Chum thought. And all of a sudden, people, and he just said, blasted back. He says, I know this guy. He's not a terrorist. I know all these people. Uh, this is complete nonsense, what the government is saying. And as a result of that, we got very, very good press. Um, and it's, it, it was a. I think to this day, the press um, reveres Shamshai, and they go to him for everything that has to do with the Muslim community because they realize what an incredibly courageous person he was to stand up with that intense pressure and, and blast back and, and essentially be right. One more question? One more question. Yeah. So what's your rights as an activist, whether you're a communist, socialist, whatever it may be? What are your rights? Well, as an American citizen, no rights protection. Right, but when you look at this, uh, when you have dissenting... When you dissent? Right, such as if you're leaning communist or socialist, All right. if you're more prominent, does uh, your rights just get taken away, like you were talking about earlier, and is U.S. similar to Iran or North Korea? Well, certainly if you are a communist, for example, these folks in pink, are being investigated for material support for terror. Most of them are either communists or anarchists. Right. 
that may be the reason they're being they're going out. So, um, yeah, it probably helps to get uh, investigated. Um, but uh, basically, you're all supposed to have, we're all supposed to have the same rights. Um, that has not happened. Um, and there was, of course, a period with the, the McCarthy era where being a communist was really bad. In the United States, we got to the point where we could say, oh, this is just red baiting, you're just red baiting people, and you could you know, kind of deflect it. Now we're getting back again to the idea, well, let's, maybe we should lock them up. Um, but I'm hopeful that at least those days are partially over. Um, the, the government will do it in a different way than they did before. That's about all I can say to you. I, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a moving target. I don't know exactly how much they're going to go after the left. They could go after it even more. You're asking me to predict it? I can't. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Thank you very much.